Um, so I guess we'll just start out with one of the first questions we had was, what did you want to be when you grew up? The first time I really thought about what I wanted to be when I grew up was in high school when I met my uh, principal, Roberta Bird Barr, and I wanted to go into broadcasting. What drew you to that field? Everything about Roberta Bird Barr. <laughs> Can you talk about who she is? Pardon? Can you talk about who she is? So Roberta Bird Barr was the first woman and black women to be principal in of a high school in the state of Washington. And I actually did not know that fact uh, when I went to school, the historical nature of her position there. But I just loved everything about her. I had just become kind of politic. I had always been politically active, but there were some things that had happened in middle school that really set a fire underneath me um, politically. And then when I went into high school, I met Roberta Bird Barr and she taught me the politics of social justice, that it wasn't just enough to be, uh, have feelings about social justice, that you actually needed to be organized and think strategically about um, social justice. And she mentored me in on several things that I worked on in high school. And that really set me on my course for the rest of my life. And I always valued the, her mentorship um, in that way. Yeah. What, what do you think grandma and grandpa's hopes for you and your education were? Did they ever talk about that with you? Well, I had a chance to ask grandma about that. Uh, in the last, oh, the last 15 years before her dementia really took hold. And I'm glad I actually had a chance because, uh, as you know, she and grandpa, their hopes were to start an international school when they first got married. Dad came from Czechoslovakia, very liberal, progressive, very highly educated artistic family there and he emigrated and defected to America and mom came from a very poor kind of racist <laughs> uh, family and uh, struck out on her own very very concerned about what was happening with civil rights but not attached to her family at all really wanting to make change in the world and they really connected with each other and wanted to do something. And her hopes and dreams was to start international school. She got very involved in something new that was happening at the time, Head Start program, and became, uh, and after I was born, uh, really became involved in this, this thing called volunteer busing, although I'm not even sure it had a name at that time. And this was in the early to mid sixties. And when I asked her, what did you and dad want for me? And she said, <laughs> she said, um, <laughs> we wanted you to be uncomfortable in all white spaces. Yeah. Did they ever talk about sending you? Because you went to TT Minor in the Central District, which was pretty far from where you grew up. And <clears throat> did they ever, like, talk about that change with you? Did you know what was going on? Did you know why they were sending you there at the time? Because you were pretty young. Yeah, this was 1970, uh, 71. At that time, uh, people didn't really talk to kids. <laughs> they weren't part of the conversation about what was happening in their lives. When I raised you, I always wanted you to have some agency in your life. And even at a young age, I would talk to you about Julia, what would you like to do? And I think that that's, that's a much more common phenomenon these days. But back in the 60s and 70s, that was much less common. You didn't 
have a sit down and have a conversation with kids about here's what we're going to do today. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? So when I was growing up, uh, it, it was just a different style of parenting. I don't think that, I think that that was much more common. And I would just find myself plopped into different situations. I would be reading a book and we're going to the store, come on, or we're going on vacation. And there would be absolutely no conversation ahead of time. And that's how it was when I ended up at TT Minor. It was just one day I was at Green Lake School, the neighborhood school next to our house. And then the next day I was at TT Minor, um, a school that was 45 minutes or so away from our house. It was just one day I was here and one day I was another place. There was never any conversation about it that I knew of. But the talk of civil rights and the talk about change and all those types of things were happening at the around the house all the time. Uh, but I was just never a part of that conversation. So I was not really aware of their plans for me and where I was going to be going to school. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you remember like feeling? Because that's a, that's a pretty big difference to like the local school and then you're taking the bus and or being driven to like a whole different neighborhood did you fit in like how was that acclimating to that new school I think the getting there was probably the biggest frustration and what I remember most back in the 60s and 70s everything really was neighborhood based um, you shop local stores were neighborhood stores were literally every few corners you shop local you played local you went to neighborhood schools to drive far to go anywhere really was not the norm even going to you know people in seattle would understand if you know, living in Green Lake and going to Northgate Mall was probably a 10 minute drive. That seemed forever <laughs> back in the day. But there really weren't suburbs back then, right? Suburbs weren't a thing then. Everything was local and neighborhood. So for me to go from North Seattle, cross the Ship Canal, which was the dividing line back then between when you're talking about redlining and North Seattle, which was predominantly white and South Seattle, which was not uh, the ship canal and crossing that and going to TT minor, it was a big deal. And just to go back a little bit, part of the reason they enrolled me there was because of the frustration of what was not happening with volunteer busing. They were frustrated with all the roadblocks that, that, the, that the city had placed on volunteer busing. The families had been trying to get this to happen for some time. And as I understand it, um, it had finally been approved and then a lawsuit was placed. Um, blocking it again and so they just decided to hell with it we're just going to enroll her and mm -hmm. so to get there they had to drive me or I was placed on a city bus and how old were you <laughs> eight <laughs> nine mm -hmm. um, so it was quite an ordeal really to make that commitment that every day either your parents are going to drive you or you're going to go on a city bus. I would never do that to you. Um, it has nothing to do. It, it was just, it was a different time is I, I guess all I can say. And so at that time it was called, uh, I don't think I was the only one. It was at the very, very, very beginning of busing. And I guess context is really important here because at least in Seattle, when people talk about busing, the first thing that comes to people's mind is mandatory busing 
but that didn't start until like 78 okay, and that's later pardon that's way later than oh than yeah people. mandatory busing i think is the first thing that comes to people's minds when they think about busing and that was um way beyond almost the end of even my high school um but before mandatory busing there was voluntary busing and before voluntary busing there was voluntary racial transfers and i was part of the voluntary racial transfers wow. and even within voluntary busing <laughs> we can even um talk about the nuances there there was voluntary busing and then there was a twist your arm hold a stick to your head <laughs> busing uh, volunteer busing because many families it was voluntary but many families had such pressure um, that was put upon them that they may not have felt it was voluntary or may not have actually understood that it was voluntary even though it actually was so when you're talking to people about busing you really need to be specific about the time frame and if you're talking about mandatory voluntary or voluntary racial transfer uh, because those are all very different time frames the other thing to understand about seattle busing is that it happened in stages uh, most of it happened starting in middle schools and they staggered it different middle schools happened at different times so it's very when you're talking about busing in seattle it's very important to talk about what time period which schools and every school and every time period had a completely different experience and then on top of that every individual had a different experience which is one of the reasons i'm so excited to to gather the oral history of more and more stories because it's the only way to get a three-dimensional understanding of the experience but my experience was very very early and i was one of just a couple of students that was bused to TT Minor in the very, very early days in 1970, 1971, and was one of just a couple white students that went to TT Minor, which was a predominantly all black uh, school in the central district of Seattle, Washington. Did you like it? Did you have fun there? Elementary school's fun years. Did you notice a difference like when you were younger? Cause I think, cause I grew up in Green Lake too and we went to the same elementary school and then we, <laughs> we moved me too. So I'm like, I know what it's like to go to school in Green Lake and then be moved somewhere else. But did you have fun? Were the kids nice? <laughs> I, it was one of the most transformative experiences of my life. I've talked to you about that before that it just, um, that experience I had at TT Minor um, was so transformative. I know for a fact that I would not be the human I am today if I had not had that experience. I shudder to think. And, um, you know, I was not that happy at Green Lake. You know, I grew up with an immigrant dad and it was, I think, okay for my first few years there but i had start started to get bullied a little bit and uh i was less and less happy at green lake and when i went to tt minor i think the biggest adjustment again to say that it was all happy when i had to spend you know an hour and a half on a bus getting there and you know there is an adjustment and all um that part is true but i made friends really fast the teachers, I love the teachers. Um, I love the way that they taught. They, they were teaching math in a way that I understood it. They were teaching math in a way that applied to everyday things. I remember learning math by having a checkbook, by going 
to a pretend grocery store and learning how to understand math by grocery shopping and figuring out a budget. That was fascinating to me. I loved it. I learned so much. Uh, I learned, you know, reading the way they were teaching made so much sense to me. And I made so many, so many friends really fast. I loved it there. I do remember a time very vividly, like my second, my first, maybe going on second week there, it's, you know, so long ago, it wasn't like when I first got there, but it was like maybe the second week there. And it was between classes. So everyone was rushing out of the rooms. And I just remember there was this moment where I looked up and realized I was the only white person there. <laughs> and I kind of, I, I, I wasn't paralyzed, paralyzed, but I remember like little eight, nine-year-old me like going like, oh, wow, I'm the only white person there. And it's weird that it wasn't like my first day. It was like a week or so into it. And, um, and then I, I had a really strong feeling and I wouldn't have had the word to describe it then. I mean, now I would call it self-regulating, I guess. I remember thinking, well, wait a minute, Della, nobody's paying any attention to you. Nobody cares. And then it lasted just a split second. I thought, oh, my friends are waiting for me at the tetherball. I got to go outside. They're waiting for me. And it was kind of gone as quickly as it came. But I distinct, I do distinctly remember there was a moment when I realized that I was the only white person there. Um, but it, it let, it left almost as quickly as it came. And I don't ever really remember thinking too much about it again. <laughs> I love that. Did you, stay in the central district and like go to middle school and high school or where were you at? Well, unfortunately, as you know, dad was killed and, um, <laughs> so I wasn't able to finish all of my grade school there. And, um, mom tried for a while to keep driving me and, um, it, it didn't, it was just too much because she was now a displaced homemaker um, with two kids, Uncle Alex and, you know, Auntie Nora, my two younger siblings, they were three and four. So they were too young to go to school. And now she had to take multiple jobs. So I went from going to TT minor to actually not being in school at all. And uh, having to stay home and take care of Nora and Alex while mom worked multiple jobs. Uh, eventually, um, <laughs> it was a really hard time. And uh, so, ironically, this, the skills that I learned at TT Minor, where I learned how to do math with a checkbook and grocery shopping, really came in handy. Because I was the one that was going to, <laughs> I was the one doing the grocery shopping and taking care of kids at nine. So eventually I did go back to uh, Green Lake. Uh, sorry, that was just a really hard time. And um, I didn't like it. It was an all white space. I didn't have a whole lot of friends there uh, but very quickly after that it was time to go to middle school and that was 1973 and Hamilton Middle School that is 1973 is the year that busing started in earnest and in Seattle and so black students from the central district were being bused and Hamilton was one of the first middle schools where students were bused and I got to see my friends. 
and uh, I could not have been happier. And mm -hmm. so I not only saw my friends from GT Minor, uh, I met a whole bunch of new friends, many of them you know as your aunts and uncles, because mm -hmm. the friends that I know there are friends that I still have today, 50 years later, you know, Delia, Vaughn, all of them, you know, we just mm -hmm. celebrated my birthdays and you're there. Our kids are friends. We're friends. We're still friends from middle school. Our kids are friends. So you know them all. Uh, but yeah, we, uh, I went to uh, the neighborhood middle school, but it was uh, one of the first middle schools in Seattle where busing actually formally started. Wow, that's that's a lot. <laughs> um, do you remember the the admin or the staff doing anything to like welcome these students in? Because I think you know, growing up in Seattle, white people aren't the friendliest sometimes. So I'm just wondering if there was an effort made to welcome these students into, into the school, whether it be Hamilton or high school. I think it would be naive to say that everyone was really into it just because I know from some of the really sexist teachers that they were probably some racist ones as well. But I think that there were enough I think that there were enough that were really into it that they really wanted to try to make it work. And the evidence of that is that they, for example, created spaces where we could get together and try to learn about each other. So we had at, at Hamilton, we had African-American students being bussed in we also had a huge Filipino population actually living in Wallingford because one of the things that was happening is we had um, uh, families who were uh, leaving Marcos and who were settling in around the Wallingford area. So we had a large Filipino population. We had African-American students there. We were starting to see some Vietnamese students come, the Vietnam War was going on at that time, the, a larger population would come in high school. Uh, and then we had, you know, the white students as well. And the teachers took, like they would take several of the classrooms, open them up and make kind of hangout lounges where they put jukeboxes and beanbag chairs and ping pong uh, tables to try to give encourage us to play games and uh, put out Congo drums and encourage students to bring their guitars so we could have jam sessions and uh, really creative ways for us to get together. They encouraged the African-American students to come up with clubs. And then like we had um, uh, assemblies where students could come up with ideas on what they wanted to show or teach or present to other students. They had uh, a lot of different things where they encouraged us to learn about each other and encouraged us to hang out, which was not typical of high schools because usually you would go from class to class to class, but they intentionally created spaces and places where we could hang out and get to know each other. And also happening at this time was Title IX happened at this time. Um, so girls were getting into sports at this time too which was another opportunity for us to get to know each other. Um, like in the locker room, we would not normally be in a locker room because girls would be doing economics. 
so there was a lot happening um, uh, during this time in the early early 70s at Hamilton. Would you say that the students got along? Uh, at Hamilton, I would say, <clears throat> and I've talked, as you know, I've talked to a lot of, um, I went back and spoke at, at the, uh, um, in 2022, I went back and spoke to students at Lincoln and not wanting to speak for others. I actually talked to former classmates at Hamilton and Lincoln, um, non-white classmates and friends to try to get their ideas and experiences to share and their feedback was yes um very much so they said that they wanted to be there uh, at least at the hamilton stage they really wanted to be there their families wanted them to be there um, students students got along um, it was we were all very excited to know about each other and really wanted to be together. It was a blast. Yeah, I, I love like going through your yearbooks, as you know, and I would spend like hours as a kid going through them. And then like, it seemed like you guys were just having a hoot and a half. Like it was a happening time. And I just love looking back at your yearbook photos but also your personal photos and seeing how you interacted with your friends and people in the neighborhood and it it's great to see it makes me happy it was a grand experiment um, mm -hmm. it sounds like it it's before it got, <laughs> it's before it got all screwed up <laughs> yeah well that was would you say after like you left Lincoln and kind of transitioned into the world a little bit more Things really got screwed up when it became mandatory. Yeah. People don't want to be forced to say something. Yeah. So we went, so we had a group of students who wanted to be together. And we had this really, this microcosm, this, um, and I'm sure there were problems. I, I don't want to say that it was all, I mean, of course there were problems. You know that I had problems with sexist teachers and I'm sure there were racist teachers too. So I'm not trying to put a shiny coat on everything. We know, you know, we had students that had committed suicide. I mean, there's, it was the seventies. There was a lot going on, but in terms of desegregation, um, it was overall, there were some really positive, interesting things happening. Underneath, students were having problems at home. There were kids doing drugs. There was sexual assaults. There were all kinds of things going on. So I don't want to say like it was all shiny and wonderful and beautiful. The 70s were a rough time. There were a lot of things going on. Okay. But as far as, uh, you know, busing, there were some positive things that were happening. And then we all moved to Lincoln together. So there was a lot of us who were very familiar with each other already. And then we moved to the high school, which was pretty much across the street together. Mm -hmm. And that would have been in 1976. And that's when Roberta Bird Barr, the principal, and then even more students came bust in. So many of us knew each other and then more students got bust in, still voluntary at this time. Because again, the Seattle plan or whatever it was called didn't actually happen until 1978. And at this time, we still got a lot of Filipino students in the neighborhood. At this time, we have a huge influx of uh, Vietnamese students that are coming in. We've got, again, a lot of students that are having, you have to understand the underlying current of things that students are dealing with. So context is everything, right? This is before there, this is before uh, any rape centers or the word rape really came into vocabulary 
there were no battered women's shelters. There were no rape centers. Women couldn't have credit cards in their own names. Women couldn't own property, um, <laughs> you know, right? Uh, students, uh, men were coming back from the Vietnam War. There were kids who were afraid to go home because their dads were freaked out with all the things that we have names for now that we didn't have names for back then. We had students committing suicide. Um, there were teachers being inappropriate with students. Years later, we find out one of the administrators was grooming boys. Um, we had uh, some students who were already emancipated from their parents. We had a large group of students who were LGBTQIA long before um, that acronym, or it was even safe to come out. Uh, so there was a lot, a lot of things going on underneath that, right? But we, for the most part, we had fights over boyfriends and girlfriends. We had fights over who was the toughest, you know? Um, but we, we didn't fight really over race. One of the things that was happening during that time because of the influx of, um, um, because of what was happening with the end of the Vietnam War and everything, there were a lot of Asian gangs in Seattle. Um, and so there, were some, there was some violence happening in South Seattle around Asian gangs. And one of the things that um, Eunice, my friend Eunice Valenciano talked about was how Roberta would regularly gather the Asian students in the auditorium for a day and just say, hey, let's tell me what's going on. How's it going? Let's talk about what's happening with your life and just hang out with everybody in the auditorium and hear what's going on. And we never had any of those problems at Lincoln at all. Mm -hmm. um, Lincoln had one big riot in 1970 um, and that was it. Yeah. Um, how would you say that your experience with this volunteer busing system shaped you and how you carried yourself after graduating from Lincoln? Well, going back to what mom and dad wanted, which is for me to feel uncomfortable in all white spaces, they definitely achieved that. Um, I never felt comfortable in an all white space after that. Even going back to the fourth, you know, even going back to my neighborhood school, anywhere, publicly, professionally, and so let's unpack what that means. I know if I go to an all white space that, that there are stories missing, that there are people missing. I feel like I'm not, I'm going into a space where I'm probably not going to be understood, that I'm probably going to have to watch my back. Um, I feel go feel like I'm going to walk into a space where people are not going to totally understand me. I'm going to walk into a space. I don't know if I can trust people. There's data missing. There's stories missing. There's something wrong with this space. Mm -hmm. Because that's the truth. If you're walking into an all white space, there's something wrong. And, you know, you talked, Julia, about, ironically, when I got married and then we got divorced and you ended up going back to Green Lake Elementary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's fast forward. Let's <laughs> fast forward. Okay. You're four years old. I'm recently divorced a single mom living ironically in the same neighborhood that I grew up in same house everything yeah 
and you end up going to Green Lake Elementary. And I am simultaneously working in television, <laughs> dream come true, working odd hours, thankful though to have a neighborhood school that I can just quickly take you to, but look, taking one look around and going, oh my goodness. Um, look at all these white people. But getting it a try. And then Which my beautiful <laughs> Mexican American daughter starts drawing pictures of herself with blue high, blue eyes and blonde hair. And I hoping it's a one off and it's not. You continue to. And then your grandma observes a very upsetting situation in your kindergarten class where your mm -hmm. white teacher accuses the one black student kindergarten boy of stealing something when he hasn't. She did that a lot too. Even when I was really young, I was like, why is yeah. this teacher always picking on us? Why is the magnifying glass on like me and the two other kids of color? And I was like, I'm pretty white. Like I, but it was, I was just different enough from my classmates. So yeah. And I was like, that's it. We are out of here. And yeah. I tried to talk to the principal about it and she wouldn't give me the time. And I'm like, you're out of here. And if I have to homeschool you. And I think the thing that I knew is that I could teach you how to read and write if I had to, what I couldn't teach you is the immersive experience of socialization, of being, mm -hmm. of growing up and being in a space of people from a variety of cultures. And when we found Olympic Hills in Northeast Seattle, which was the absolute furthest space from our house. Literally. <laughs> um, and I thought, it was such a beautiful place, 18 different languages spoken and, um, you know, mostly immigrants and refugees, but mm -hmm. an amazing staff of people who, who, what did I say about Hamilton? They wanted to make it happen for the students. Right. So it was the absolute perfect environment, but it took an extra 40 minutes to get there in the morning. And it took me an extra hour and a half to get to work but it seemed like the perfect situation. And, and I remember the first, <laughs> you went from, <laughs> you went from drawing yourself with blue eyes and blonde hair that first week to being so excited and telling me what you learned about hijab fashion and yeah. different ways to wear scarves and telling me you know about ramadan and and i just thought oh my god yes yes and what we learned from you know sh breaking bread and, and sharing meals with the different mothers and sitting across the table from a Somalian mother when we barely spoke the same language and, and trying to figure each other out while you guys are playing in the next room. And those experiences, I don't know how anybody would not want that. Still to this day, that was, I think back so fondly on Olympic Hills and, you know, I was only there for first through fifth grade, but it really shaped how I saw the world, who I surrounded myself with, because we did end up moving to the suburbs eventually, you know, middle and high school. And even looking back and like hearing your experience with high school and I'm like, wow, my schools were very segregated. And I think there were groups of us that didn't really fit in with the upper class, you know, Scandinavian <laughs> students that really 
filled most of our spaces, but we came together and similar to you and what I hear from you and we found each other and learned from each other. And I think that going to a school like for me, Olympic Hills, when I was that young and a UTT minor, it just really set a precedent for the rest of our lives and what we held important to us and the opportunities we sought out at all ages, even today. And yeah, I think it's, I would have been a completely different person had I stayed at Green Lake and then, you know, went to Eckstein and then Roosevelt, that would have been my high school. And I asked Eunice and Vaughn, you know, my two friends, you know, two of many friends that I had from middle school that went to Hamilton and somebody said, well, you know, did it make a difference? You know, do you, do you say that? And then we talked about it and we said, well, let's think about this. First of all, look at, we're all friends. And then we realized it opened our minds to who we are as individuals, how we saw the world, who we picked as friends and who we picked as partners. And then it influenced how we raised our kids mm -hmm. and who they chose as partners and who they raised their kids. And then we, when we looked at what our kids are doing in the world, all of them are doing things that are ch literally changing the world in art and literature and politics internationally every single one and so is it something tangible that you can put your hand on or i don't know to me that's enough yeah i think challenging the spaces that we move through is one of the most important things that i try and remember yeah Look at 1059. A news person always ends on time. <laughs> How do you like that, Diane? Uh, you guys are doing amazingly well. I did not even want to interrupt with like a hand signal. So I'm glad you had your eye on that. Um, we definitely have some follow-up questions because your story has been absolutely incredible and, and we want to hear more. Um, and then we also want to save time at the very end for you to kind of do your your thank yous, um, if there's a, a certain way that you guys want to close your interview. So, um, Sophia, are there questions that you want to follow up with? Yeah, so I just want to go back to the beginning of your busing experience. I know you talked a lot about how um, that happened so differently, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about your personal experience. Do you remember stepping on that bus going the first time? Can you describe like what you saw at the window? You mentioned you crossed through different neighborhoods. Is there like a point you could see that change reflected outside? Well, there were no, this is before there was organized busing. So there were no school buses. It was a public bus. So I remember um, being a little scared <laughs> because it was a public bus. And uh, I remember there was a Metro bus driver who always saved a seat right by him so I could feel safe, uh, kind of sitting sideways looking at him. And those were the days when my mom and dad or dad couldn't drive me because there was, this is before there was organized buses, school buses. It didn't exist. And when we talk about busing in Seattle, it was by far the majority were black and brown students being bused north. There were very few white students being bused into black and brown neighborhoods. Now, when you get into mandatory busing in 1978, yes, they were trying to control the numbers and there were magnet schools and, and they were controlling the numbers. But this was on a voluntary basis. There were only a few of us. 
So there was no school bus. <laughs> and I was pretty scared. It was a long way to go. And could you tell Julia more about, like, describe that being on the bus? Was it, um, and since it wasn't a school bus, what did that look like? How did that feel differently than what you had known before? It was always very frustrating not to have be, not to be able to have a say in where I was going and what I was doing. And that's not to say that I didn't like being there because I did. I liked being there, but not to have any control over your environment and have other people making decisions for you. The same was true on the reverse. I would have liked to stay at TT minor. I wanted to, but it was just not sustainable after my dad was killed um, to have that, to, to try to make that journey every day and expect my mother to either drive me when she was working multiple jobs or to, uh, to take a public bus. And in fact, I couldn't because I needed to stay home and take care of two kids. But there was this out of control feeling of, of wishing I could just be a kid and have some control over my environment. Thank you. Could you also share a little bit more about your parents, Julia's grandparents? Um, you said they wanted to uh, make sure you weren't comfortable in an all white space. Do you know where that belief stemmed from? My mom grew up in Everett, Washington, and she, if you were to look at a 1950s white yearbook where everybody looked the same in a cookie cutter, she would be one of those people in it. And her family was very racist and she grew, she was very concerned about what she had seen in the fifties and um, in the civil rights, what was happening. And she had no one to talk to about it. And she talked about wanting to think maybe she could get on a bus and go to Mississippi or help with something, but she didn't even know how to buy a bus ticket. That's how isolated she was. Um, but in her heart of hearts, she really felt that it was all wrong and wanted to do something about it. So as soon as she graduated from high school, she went to the University of Washington, studied education, and felt in her heart of hearts the best way was to open an international school. And so she wanted to uh, bring kids of all, age, uh, of all different backgrounds together in the same room. There was... Uh, a lot of work happening in the central district around something called the Head Start program. And she found other people who believed the same and was connecting with them. And so there was a lot of work kind of building around this. And uh, so she found other people who held similar ideas, told my dad, this is what we're going to do. Um, and he said, okay we're going to start an international school. <laughs> it didn't happen. And so the next best thing was putting our daughter in the central district in something that is not an international school, but has a lot of black and brown faces. And she's going to learn what it feels like to be othered. I think also it's important to note that just very clearly, grandma and grandpa were very political people. And that trickled down through how they raised you, whether grandma knew it or not, because she was, her head was always kind of somewhere else. But yeah, they were very vocal about people who were being discriminated against or treated wrong in any capacity. And they wanted to help and not perpetuate the problem. And so that's a lot of what I'm hearing you say too, mom. Yeah. So just a quick, one of the things is I had two um, black and indigenous siblings, foster siblings when I was growing up. 
So when I was three, they had um, a brother and a sister who were black and indigenous that they fostered. So I grew up with them in the house early on. Also, my this is to give you an idea about how strongly they felt about it. My dad came to this country via the CIA. <laughs> um, and they were involved in the civil rights movement and the CIA did not like that. So they were threatened with deportation all the time, but they felt so strongly about civil rights and being involved that they lived with this threat all the time from the government. That's how strongly they felt about civil rights work and being involved. Um, we went to mom took us to, fundraisers for the Black Panthers in the Central District. Um, we went to um, Black churches sometimes for different things. We, we did, a lot of that was going on. So at a young age, I was not unfamiliar with the Central District or different things that were going on. There was this white lady from Everett who was taking her kid <laughs> around to these places and I had uh, two foster siblings that I was raised with early on, um, too. They felt very, very strongly about, to the point that they were threatened with deportation. I think it speaks to grandma's beliefs, too, because even after grandpa died and she was really on her own and did not have much agency as, like, a human, because she was a woman in, what was it, 71, and she still continued to challenge what was considered the norm and her family was mortified. Her family is really racist. And even when she, there was the opportunity for them, her family to support her as a single parent, you know, with the caveat that you kind of have to calm down, like get back in your role as a homemaker, just be silent. Don't challenge anything. She was like, no, like I don't need your help that bad because I know what I believe in is right. And I don't think I can sit and be silent. And that's something I've always really loved about her is it's, it's not, it's very black and white with her. She knows what's right. And she, even if doesn't, she doesn't know how she's going to help. She's like, I'm there. Like, just tell me what to do. Like, I'll figure it out. I'll do it in my own way. Like, and I think that's, I love that about her so much. <laughs> and Della, I'd love to hear a little bit more about if there was any reaction when you started going to um, a predominantly black and brown school from the kids in your neighborhood. I didn't have many friends there uh, at all. Um, <clears throat> so, not really. <laughs> I had a, there was a, one of my friends in the neighborhood was, um, was a, a gal who was mixed race. So she wouldn't have thought anything about it. Um, and I, but I really didn't have many friends in the neighborhood. And also afterwards, I was busy raising two kids. So I didn't have any friends. And then when I went back to Green Lake, I was very isolated because I had nothing in common with those people. And I felt very, very isolated. Again, I was going into an all white space. I didn't feel safe there. I didn't care about them. And I didn't really have many friends again until I went back to Hamilton and connected again with people I knew. So there really wasn't, um, I didn't have a whole lot of friends to give feedback. That does sound like a difficult transition. Um, and I think someone that you mentioned was that principal that you looked up to. Yes. Um, if you, there's anything you want to share about her, um, what exactly about her inspired you? Um, Well, again, she taught me the politics of social justice and how to strategize, again, in my political work. 
and everything that I am today, really, I'm a very political person and I do a lot of strategy and I learned all of that from her. When I went into, first went into Lincoln High School, there were problems with racist and sexist teachers that I wanted to make complaints against. Uh, and she had her hands full. They they put her in that school because it was one of the most problematic schools in the Seattle School District. There was no doubt about it that they put her there because of it. And um, and she she helped me read between the lines and helped me figure out how to do what I needed to do to. Uh, I guess I'll just say it, bring this teacher down, who was a real sexist and racist teacher. Um, and that was kind of my goal while I was at Lincoln was to bring, there was a teacher who would make regularly racist and sexist uh, comments about students. And it was my goal to make a formal complaint against him before I left the school. And I did do that. And she showed me the ropes on how I would do that successfully without technically getting involved herself. And that's how I learned how to do political things like that. And she also, when I wanted to rip up 50, you know, textbooks that were 50 years old, instead of just ripping them up and tearing them apart in anger, she suggested some other strategies that would be more productive. And so she was a real sounding board when I was a really angry young feminist um, and showed me more productive ways to do things. And I think when, when we talk about what m my friend said about uh, her gathering, for example, Asian students in auditorium when there were problems happening in the rest of the school district, uh, her gathering them and, and into the auditorium and having conversations with them about, Hey y'all, what's, what's going on? How are things going? I know for a fact that she fought to get uh, scholarships and, and, and funding so that um, African-American students who were bused there to Lincoln could go on special trips uh, where they couldn't afford. I know that for a fact. And um so she was working her butt off. I mean, in addition to all of this, she's dealing with teachers who are making inappropriate, <laughs> you know, advances on students, all these other problems that are happening at, at Lincoln. And, and yet she's still managing um, to make a difference in student lives. I, I don't honestly know how, how she did it. Uh, but she was a huge influence in me in that way. So my politics as uh, as Della Costanley Juarez are really all based around Roberta Birdbar. Can you just briefly describe uh, to Julia, Della, what kind of what it felt like to be in her presence, in Roberta's presence, like what did she look like and kind of how did it feel to be in the room with her? <laughs> well, she, she had a very, very low voice. She was a, a Shakespearean actor as well as uh, she, she acted with Paul Robeson, which I don't know if you guys are kind of young. I don't know if you know who Paul Robeson is, but she was a, th a Shakespearean actress and she had a very deep voice and, and she would get this little look on her face when you knew she was going to say something. <laughs> and I remember, for example, a classic Roberta Bird Bar thing would be when I wanted to deface the history books for saying something really horrible about slavery and uh, Indians on Thanksgiving. And I, and I, I thought, well, before I tear these pages out of these books, I, I should talk to Roberta about it. And so I popped my head into her office one day. And I remember I said, you know, Mrs. Barr, what, what do you think the consequences might be if I did something like this? Right. She said, well, you know, Della, I don't think your teacher would appreciate that, but you know, more importantly, 
what would your fellow students learn from that? And I learned, I knew enough about Roberta to know that the second part of that question was the most important part. And what I knew from that is that she was telling me that I needed to do something positive with that instead. And that was all about Roberta. So what we ended up doing was instead of taking out the pages, we wrote in the margins. We wrote the missing information in the margins. And that's what I learned from Roberta, right? So we would say, look up this information in the library. Read about this. Add this. What about this? And because there weren't enough books, we had to check them out. Uh, and so eventually we got to write those in all of the books. And that's what I learned from Roberta, you know, is that I could have, if I hadn't checked with her, I would have written, I would have torn all those pages out in anger. But instead, maybe there were some students who saw our notes and out of curiosity did look up all that information. And in the process, we ourselves had to look deeper into what research, well, what would we put in the margins? So my education went much, much deeper because of her. And my complaint against the teacher for his racist and sexist remarks stayed, stayed on his record for the rest of his life. And he was eventually not able to teach anymore. And I know that he was somebody that was a thorn in her side, but what else could she honestly take on with everything else that she was dealing with in that school? What more could she take on? And I knew that. And then here comes this little girl who goes, what if I wanted to do this? <laughs> and I do remember walking into her office one day when I plopped down all the evidence that I had against him. And we realized that we had a case against him. So, yeah, she was everything to me. She sounds incredible. So I can see why. <laughs> She's, look her up and I'll send you the video to her early recordings on TV from the um, 60s. And you will be amazed at how she interviewed people in Seattle on television. She was one of the first black women on television in Seattle. That's amazing. Um, I have, I, I realize we're like pressed on time. Do either of you have a hard stop at 2.30? Okay. Um, Sophia is in back-to-back -back interviews today, so she might have to jump, but we've been trying to tag team on things that we're both very curious. But um, so Della, you've mentioned that you often, your, your, your parents wanted you to feel uncomfortable in all white spaces and that you very much did. And so I, I've been wondering, given how drawn you felt to like black and brown or more diverse, racially diverse spaces, if it ever caused any kind of confusion for you about your own racial identity and, and if so, how any of that kind of came up again when you saw Julia's self-portraits? Oh, okay. Um, those fe that feels like two separate questions. That, take it however you want. <laughs> I think, yeah, I felt embarrassed to be white at times. Uh, I felt embarrassed to be white. Um, and wait, what was this? I think. Uh, and then. 
you know, it's, it's prompted a lot of interesting conversations between my daughter because I raised her to be honest and to ask questions. And I've raised her to uh, be an independent thinker. And she has. So this raises questions. This, this means that she is often challenging me on things. Uh, about whether there are times when I have crossed the line into cultural appropriation or whether my thoughts border sometimes on uh, whether I have said something racist or whether uh, what it means if my skin is darker than hers and she's the Mexican-American daughter or, I mean, we have, she's asked me questions that I have to sit very uncomfortably with sometimes. Um, and this is, this is not, as you get older in life, <laughs> you know, this can be hard sometimes. And then I have to remember myself, this is exactly how I wanted her to be. And so we've had conversations where we've had to leave the room and come back to it and leave the room and come back to it. Um, what would you say to that, Julia? Well, she thinks I'm just, that was, thank you for sharing that. I'm just going to remind you to talk to each other. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Julia. Yeah, okay. So, Julia. <laughs> I don't know. I would say that that there have been times where I think that my involvement has caused me to be embarrassed to be white and I think that you have challenged me in times to really continue to have deep conversations and I appreciate those even though sometimes they can be uncomfortable in the moment yeah I think it's for me important just because you have so much experience with being in diverse spaces to remind you and also myself, like we are white women and not forgetting that we have a lot of privilege in that space and in that capacity. And so I think that's where a lot of those conversations stem from just reminding ourselves that there's still limits to how we can interact with certain communities and our positions just entering them because we have so much privilege. So I would say, yeah, that's, those conversations can be really hard. And I think we've had conversations that you get really defensive about, but then you are amazing at processing it. And like you said, coming back and recognizing that, you know, maybe you misstepped or even challenging me on some of my opinions. And I think that having that openness and ability to confront when these issues arise has been really valuable to me and, and helps me feel comfortable just talking to you about anything because we can have those hard conversations. And I know that, you know, it's natural for people to get defensive. I get defensive all the time when we talk about things. Um, but knowing that like, regardless of the hard moments, I know you're going to process and think and chew on it. And there's always the opportunity to return and follow up. And I love that. Well, thank you, sweetie. I think the challenge with the challenge with these types of, of conversations and understanding as, as white people and circling back a little bit to the idea of desegregation or integration is the idea that 
it's a moving, it's a something moving and fluid that mm -hmm. you have to constantly be educating and growing and learning We're and always, yeah. always. And, and so it's a very fluid thing. And so if you're not willing to continually educate and continually immerse yourself in situations where you're going to grow and learn and reflect, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I didn't have you to push me, especially as one gets older, I would be at a real loss. And so as uncomfortable as I may get sometimes, I treasure, I treasure the way that you uh, push me into uncomfortable situations. Yeah, that's one thing I really love about us is like, I'm going to check you and you're also going to check me. And <laughs> it's truly out of a place of immense love and respect and just wanting each other to continue our journey of, of learning and growth and there's no malice in it no like oh I'm gonna get you like it's just always pushing each other to be better and understand the world better and I appreciate the perspective you bring as a younger person and I've always appreciated especially in your activist work when you're out there, whether it's March for Your Lives or whether it's your whatever political work it is, that that you do keep one eye to the past and that you have said, Mom, you know, historically, what is there to know about this or that? Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate how we have that together that I feel I can ask you for your opinion as a young person so I don't miss out on your perspective and that you'll you'll ask me if there's anything that you might need to know for context. I think because you've been navigating all of these spaces growing up and non-white spaces and white spaces, you just you have a lot of lived experience that not everybody has. Because I think, you know, growing up in the Seattle area, white people can be very sheltered and intentions in completely the right place. Um, I know we were talking, you know, or you had mentioned being woke, but then like, do you follow through with what you say you believe? Are you teaching that to your kids? Are you practicing it? And so to actually have someone who has so much experience navigating in the Seattle community and it's been really helpful when yeah it comes to my own how the events I go to when I volunteer with the educational opportunities I seek out and it, it, it's very different than what I've seen some of my peers in Seattle have access to Thank you both for, for uh, taking on like a long list of follow-up questions. Um, I still want to give you a chance to, to um, kind of wrap things up because we are at the end and I want to thank you for your additional time. Um, so if there's anything you'd like to say to each other to close out or final questions you want to ask, um, now would be the time to do it. And then we're going to take about five silent seconds at the end and then I will t um, turn off the recorder. I feel like I got to say everything. We could go on forever. <laughs> I guess. Oh, no, I no, I guess I got to say anything. What? You have a thought. You have a thought. Share it. <laughs> well, no, just quickly. One of the things I was telling you about earlier, Julia, when we were talking about like the impact it has on our lives and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at like, I was, when I was thinking about like Kimberly Crenshaw, when she came up with that word intersectionality for like feminism and stuff. 
and uh, in the 90s. And I was thinking about that the other day. And I thought the reason the word intersectionality came up for feminism was because white feminists were so separated from black women, from feminists. And I had, I was thinking about that for so long and she's such a genius. I love Kimberly Crenshaw and that word is so perfect. But the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, growing up in a busing situation where I did in the 70s, like 73, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, that was the second wave of feminism. And I was growing up with Black women, with Filipino women, with Peruvian women, with Indigenous women. And we were all hanging out and growing up with each other. And we were talking about politics and we knew about each other's lives. And I, when I was growing up, it would never occur to me that not to ask my sisters of color their opinions on something. And it would never occur to me that they wouldn't have a different opinion on feminism than white women. Of course they were. I knew women of color had a different opinion about feminism than white women because I was talking to them every day. I grew up with them. So in the 90s and 2000s, when this whole discourse happened between feminism and, and white women and black women, I'm like, well, of course, how could you not know that? And I realized that my experience growing up in middle school and high school growing up around women of different backgrounds and races was that's another reason why it was so valuable for me is because it happened so organically exactly um, yeah. yeah yeah and how interesting it was that in the 90s kimberly in her brilliance and coming up with the word intersectionality but why was that necessary? It was because the world was so separated at that time. And yet I had this beautiful experience where it happened organically for me. And I so appreciate that. And that shaped who I was at such a young age. I value that so much. I love that because I feel like you really emphasized that to me growing up as well. And yeah. It really shaped my feminism. Yeah. Totally. Well, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Okay. Good to talk to you, mother. <laughs> Julia, thank you for your questions and thank you for being you. Love you. Love you more. Love you more in a discussion. I win. 